Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm your host, Kate Burgess. We have a very special treat today for all of the wine lovers and wine aficionados out there. I interview Warwick from the Clare Valley in South Australia. Clare Valley is located a few hours north of Adelaide, slightly above the Barossa Valley. It's known for its world-class Rieslings and a curious mix of geology that makes their wine so delicious and interesting at the same time. Warwick gives us a fantastic overview of the wineries in this region while diving into the history and the impact it had on the beautiful area that it is today. Hi Warwick, welcome to Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing very well. Thanks, Kate. So I'm very excited to talk about the Clare Valley today, a little known valley within South Australia. Sometimes, you know, Barossa gets the the big raps, but I'm very excited to talk about Clare Valley. So when you step outside your home within Clare Valley, what do you see, hear and smell? Well, I'm, I'm home right now and I'm looking out the window and uh, it's a beautiful old home. Uh, it used to be the homestead of a 16,000 acre sheep farm Um it was a bung- bungalow which is largely built in the 1910s and 20s and um, out the front of the place is uh, it's not in use now but there's an old tennis court and and bowling green and an arbor that I can imagine in the 1920s the ladies you know drinking their gins and um, and pims watching watching the uh, the sport but if you look further afield we've got an orchard now across the front of uh, the property we've planted about 250 fruit nut and berry trees um, and we've got um, to the southern side uh, two vegetable beds, one that's been developed for about two and a half years and the other one's relatively fresh. And if we raise our eyes ever so slightly further, we, we basically see that we're surrounded by vineyards and rolling green hills. Um, some beautiful old gum trees as well as you, you kind of expect in Australia. Sounds pretty glorious. It sounds it's pretty glorious. Bad. Yeah. It's not bad at all. So yeah. could you give our listeners a little bit of an overview of where the Clare Valley is and the best way to get there? Oh, look, we're, we're actually getting closer, if that's possible. Um, there, there's been a really good new uh, highway put in for half of the way from Adelaide towards really splitting the difference between the Barossa Valley and the Clare Valley. And it makes us about an hour and a half uh, from the airport uh, or the city uh, by drive. Um there's not a lot of good public transport, so uh, you know it, it is largely a drive-to holiday destination. We have recently got a, an airport as well, and we, we're starting to see um, travel companies introduce um, fly, fly drive kind of very upmarket uh, boutique um, tours. And, and in fact, a couple of those have been talking to us at the Waterbell Hotel and Penobscot Farm about. Um, you know, curating Clare Valley tours that are real Epicurean food and wine focused uh, tours. Um, I guess the other really important thing is that we're, we're about about three hours further north from here is the Flinders Ranges. Um, so it's an ideal stop for there. And uh, if you kind of turn left before you get to the Flinders and and um, and keep keep going back around. You get to the Air Peninsula, Port Lincoln, Coffin Bay, um, which is about five hours drive, five or six hours drive from here. So there's been a lot of people really exploring um, South Australia's regional areas, such as the Flinders, York Peninsula, Air Peninsula, and, and using using the Clare Valley as a uh, pretty civilized food and wine stop off place. Now, as you said, we have to start with the biggest draw card the Clare Valley has to offer the wine. It's one of the oldest regions within Australia, 40 cellar doors and boasting some of the best Riesling that Australia has to offer. And with wineries, there are so many options, wine experiences, tastings. Could you tell us a little bit about the wineries in the Clare Valley and what they have to offer? Yeah, look, if, if you don't mind, Kate, I'll, I'll actually give you a little, little, a uh, few little snippets on what makes the Clare Valley different Please to do. most other wine regions in the world. Um, the first, first thing that really is important is that we have a very big diurnal temperature difference. That is the difference between the temperature, the, the high temperature of the day and the low temperature at night, which can get up to 20 degrees. 
So we're kind of like the Barossa Valley during the day and the Adelaide Hills at night. And because of that, you get really ripe fruit, but long natural acidity. And it's that combination that makes our Rieslings the way they are. I mean, they're, they're really structured, um, amazing food wines and quite different to Rieslings from other parts of the world. But that diurnal temperature difference has that impact on all of the varieties. So even our Shiraz and Cabernet, it's ripe fruit, good long acidity, and therefore you get powerful elegance. And, you know, as a self, uh, self-confess or you know, appointed uh, sommelier at the Watervale Hotel, it just makes great food wine. Um, you know, if, you, if you're a warmer region that doesn't have that cool night factor, the wines can get quite big and jammy, generous. And if you're cool but without that, that warmth during the day, the wines can get a little lean, green and aggressive. So, you know, I'm biased, clearly, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think that, uh, that circumstance uh, really leads to um, some excellent wines. And, and we have that because we are higher altitude. We're a long way from the coast, uh, which has moderating sea breezes. We're not far from the desert. And so when the hot air rises in the evening, the winds rush through the valleys and just clear out the heat, um, which certainly uh, has an impact for tourists as well. They, uh, we quite often get people wanting to snuggle up uh, in front of our fires. But, um, but that's a really important point. The other thing that I would say about Clare, um, most wine regions or appellations of the world are Appalachians because of their homogeneity or sameness. Um, you know, identical altitude, soil structures, rainfall, etc. Clare is pretty much the opposite. We've got vineyards from 250 metres to 620 metres above sea level. We've got four parallel ranges that, that create vastly different valleys in terms of sunshine hours and rainfall. And underneath the surface of the soil, because of some um, seismic activity, five hundred million years ago, you've actually had 300 million years of soils twisted up and exposed to the atmosphere. So as you go from west to east, uh, each of the ranges and each of the valleys have completely different types of soil structure. And so that leads to amazing versatility and therefore diversity of varieties and styles. So, you know, you can travel around the Clare Valley and, and feel like in, in just two or three short days that you've visited uh, several regions because of the because of the differentiation and, and versatility and uh, diversity of style. But getting back to your question, <laughs> the, <laughs> I think that's important uh, to just recap, you know, because that's that basically concept, you know, basically brings together what the region's all about. There are vast diversity as well in the wineries. There are a good half a dozen wineries that have fantastic restaurants pretty much only open during the day in amongst uh, vineyards like Skilligalee and Riley's and, and, and Pikes, Paulette's up on a ridge with a, with a beautiful view. Um, there are wineries such as Killacanoon that offer really outstanding fine wine um, specialist tastings with some of the best, best awarded wines in the world. Um, and you've got some beautiful, you know, boutique uh, places like one of my favourites, Sussex Squire, another one, KT in Auburn, Mount Horrocks I love because they're organic and biodynamic. Uh, so, you know, you, you, can, you can certainly travel around and, and unlike some other regions where you, you'll see a, a very consistent style and it's really about the winemaker's craft, here you, you're tasting the differences in about 25 different varieties and quite frankly, a thousand terroir in mm. this Appalachia. And people are also able to do a self-guided tour if they're interested about the soils and the geology and the weather there as well. That's available. Is that something that you download on your phone? Uh, you can uh, you can find that information on uh, on some websites. Um, I wish we were up to that degree of technology. Um, <laughs> I mean, on the phone, you know, in terms of some basically giving you a self-guided tour, it's something we've talked about. Um, I, I particularly love uh, talking to people at the Watervale Hotel when they come in. Um, you know, I love to do some wine and food matching and and tell these stories. Uh, and then, um, you know, when, when they, I get a sense for, for what they love to drink and, and I'll then give them a bit of guidance as to, um, 
where they should go, where they're going to find the wines that they like. That's the best way to do it. Always just talk to a local and they'll give you the best recommendations. Yeah. So as you mentioned, Clare Valley is known for its incredible Riesling and the cap that the Clare Valley use on top of the bottle is quite unique. What is it about this cap that produces the brilliant quality of wine? Well, I, I think it's the, the answer is really what is it about a cork, which is can be problematic. I mean, a, a, a cork is um, an organic uh, thing. It's, it's, you know, the cork of a tree and, and um, it certainly allows the wine to breathe. But it also means that the wine can become infected with what they call TCA. It can get cork taint. Um, and, you know, we, we spend a hell of a lot of time, energy, growing beautiful grapes, making amazing wines. And the last thing we want to, to see is that, you know, those amazing wines are spoiled by the cork of a tree that we stick in the throat of the bottle. You know, so um, the Clare Valley made a decision in 2000 that, all of the manufacturers would go to um, the, what's called a stealth enclosure, a screw cap, um, for all of the reasons. We did it together as a as a region, um, and, and in fact, most wineries in Clare now use that closure for all of the wines, including uh, red wines that might sell for five hundred or thousand dollars a bottle, because we've just found that you get a cleaner. Um, result and and you you're going to age the wines better from a preservation point of view some would argue you don't get the same oxidization aging characteristic and and that's true but the winemakers have also learned how to adapt their winemaking style to suit that um, reductive style of closure rather than oxidative style of closure very interesting. I wonder if that will be adapted throughout wineries throughout the world if they, they realise yeah, that. It is been. It is been. And uh, we're actually seeing more and more of those closures used uh, even, in, even in France, heaven forbid. There you um, go. Love yeah, the big influence. The two, yeah, the two, um, two countries that are probably slowest um, to pick up uh, on, uh, on the closure, probably USA and China, you know, so at least they've got something in common. <laughs> there you go. Now, the Clare Valley is not only known for its wine, but its history and heritage as well. What sites or locations do you recommend for people that are wanting to really learn about that history? Yeah, look, it's, it's, it is a pretty amazing uh, place. Um, South Australia actually has a very different history from the rest of Australia in that we had, um, we had no convicts here. Uh, and, in fact, it was set up as a social and political experiment um, with the land bequeathed by the Crown to the South Australian Company. The fact that it, it may well have been owned by Aboriginal tribes, you know, is, a, is, a, is another issue altogether. But, nevertheless, the, the British Crown uh, bequeathed the land to the South Australian Company who surveyed it, divided it all up, and... Um, uh, and then, like a Noah's Ark, sent across uh, boatloads of uh, people of all different um, trades, or largely Protestants. Um, and the, the area which included the Barossa and Clare was all basically uh, taken up by Sir George Fife Angus. And, um, and so it was opened up really quite quickly. Uh, so we had, had people up in this area Proclamation was 1836. People, European people were here, um, 1842. And we had, um, you know, our, our Walter Vale Hotel first licence, 1847, and wineries here, 1851. So, um, and it was quite a different um, type of culture. There was a, a Catholic church, uh, which is one of the most amazing places to visit now. It's Seven Hill built in around about 1850. Um, and we, we had Polish come into the region in what's called Polish Hill River, where you'll find the Pikes Winery um, and Paulette's over, Overlook Pat Winery. And the Irish came in as well. Um, and and they then in the 1850s as well, they, they discovered copper in the Copper Triangle, not far away, Borough and Kapunda. And the Clare Valley's smack bang in the middle of all of that. Um, and so the Clare Valley became the orchards and uh, 
and the homes of the families that um, that worked in those mines. Mm. And so it was also pretty wealthy from that perspective. And so you had, as I say, a, a very different cultural upbringing in South Australia to the rest of Australia and then a very different cultural upbringing again in Clare compared to the rest of South Australia. So, uh, you know, the, the history and heritage is quite different. Um, the other aspect is that uh, probably after that point, um, broad acre farming was introduced, lots of wheat, lots of sheep. We've got a beautiful uh, old mansion, Martindale Hall, not far from, uh, from here, um, that was actually uh, the house that was used in picnic from Hang at Hanging Rock. Uh, and you can visit that building. Um, Bungary Station as well to the north of Clare, the Hawker Station uh, can be visited um, again about late 1840s. And, and a half or an hour away in Borough, you've, you've got uh, amazing copper mines and uh, some brilliant history there too. So, you know, I think that the, the tourism opportunity or, or the things to do, I guess, in the Clare Valley are just as diverse as the wines. Mm. And in fact, um, yeah, most tourism destinations, you know, there's one diamond destination and the other destinations hang off the back of that. Um, I think the Clare Valley is more of a string of pearls. There's just, you know, dozens of amazing uh, things to look at and things to do, um, and, you know, so that you, you can basically create your own uh, string of pearls as you put together and curate your, your tour. It's a beautiful analogy. I like that a lot because people do get drawn by the one big attraction and a lot of things do get left behind, yeah. but having that diverse range of brilliant products is definitely what people want. And of course, being a food and wine region, there has to be weeks that celebrate it. And I know that during the low season, Clare Valley run SCA Gourmet Week. What is yeah. Gourmet Week? Well, Gourmet Week, it's been going for about 30 odd years um, and it's, run by the winemakers and basically it's bringing restaurants or pop-up uh, food um, vendors into the restaurant, into, sorry, the cellar doors, into the winery cellar doors. And, um, and there's entertainment, there's music, there's all sorts of things that go on. Um, but there's a, there's a calendar that's put together and uh, people can come up in buses uh, or cars uh, or use, in fact, the, uh, the shuttle bus uh, mechanism that's in place to go and visit half a dozen wineries in each day. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty full on, pretty full on. That's the third week of May. And as well, you have another festival during the low season, the Auburn French Festival. And I found it quite surprising for a small region in South Australia hosting a French festival, but obviously with the connection of wine, it, it really makes sense. So what can people expect if they were coming to visit the, the French Fest? Yeah, I must admit, this is the first one uh, we've got coming up this year. So I, I'm, a, I'm a little like you. I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Um, uh, Auburn's, you know, just 10 short kilometres away from where I live. And I'll, I'll certainly be sticking my head in and saying I'll, have, I'll be able to answer that question a little bit better after I've experienced it myself. But I, I'm, just, I'm just delighted to, to see the guys and girls in Auburn, um, you know, putting something together which is different. I guess we can expect cheese, wine, and <laughs> celebrating, I, reckon, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I reckon cheese and wine will be there for sure. Uh, lo lots, of, lots of amazing food. And I, and I think the way they're, I think the way they're it, it's always been a bit of an artsy um, little village. And the, and the Clare Valley is a tapestry of villages. Mm -hmm. There's the, the town of Clare, which is more of the commercial centre for South Australia's mid-north. And then as you come south, there's, there's Seven Hill, Penwortham, there's the Skilligalee Valley, Watervale, Leasingham, Auburn, and, and further to the to the east is Mintero. And they, they all have their different personalities. Um, and Auburn's always been a pretty arty kind of a place. And so uh, I think the French festival is just as much about French culture and, and um, music and, and art and performing art uh, as it will be about the food and wine. And as well, there are many outdoor activities for people to do with hiking and biking, which I think is the perfect coupling with, with wine. I know there's a big biking trail that runs through Clare Valley as well. 
Yeah, the, it's, the Riesling Trail, it was the old railway line. Um, and the good news about a bike track that was a railway line is that none of the hills are particularly steep. You know, it's um, so perfect it's cut through. for lots of drinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and as um, I have noticed in recent years that there's a there's a growing propensity to use e-bikes, which um, you know I can understand completely. I think it kind of defeats the purpose, but you know, uh, <laughs> it certainly helps people to get around. Um, so the Riesling Trail stretches out to the north from Clare, about eight kilometres, and there's an extension south of Auburn. Uh, called the Rattler for good reason, um, but the the main stretch is about twenty five kilometres between Clare and Auburn, and um, you know it's it's a pretty comfortable uh, ride. Um, we in Watervale, we're kind of in the middle of that, um, and so we quite often get uh, cyclists either heading off from Clare or Auburn, uh, you know, targeting us as a as a good destination to sit back, relax, have something to eat and drink and, uh, and then head back on the trail. So for our listeners out there, when is the Clare Valley low season? Yeah, it's a funny one. Um, it, the, the low seasons are determined really by the short stays from Adelaide. So mm-hmm. um, it, it relates more to school holidays or when there's not school holidays and, um, you know, as far as the South Australian school calendar is concerned. And, of course, that's not necessarily uh, in keeping with, um, you know, other reasons why it should be a low season. So the, our slowest periods are probably August and February. And, you know, August is actually a really lovely time to be in Clare because uh, it's not the it's not the right the middle of winter, but it's beautiful fireplaces. A lot of the, a lot of the winery cellar doors have fires. You know, we've got uh, several fires in, at the Waterville Hotel and, and uh, fire pits as well and a big barbecue and wood oven. We, we love to get them fired up over winter. So um, it's a different kind of place in winter. It's kind of a, you know, snugly cosy in front of the fire Chesterfield kind of destination and maybe not quite so much cycling, perhaps uh, keeping the coats on and, um, and, and just heading around and, and trying some really good wines and great food and, you know, a fairly relaxed sort of a pace. And, um, you know, February is the, February's the opposite, if, if you like, because you know, it does get pretty, pretty warm in February. Um, you know, it's generally in, be in the 30s, it can get hotter. Um, but, gee, not a bad place if you're uh, trying to run away from Northern Hemisphere freezing cold, uh, you know, to, to target... Uh, the Clare Valley and you know from a farming point of view it's actually a fantastic place to come because um, the vintage starts here in February so Mm -hmm. there's lots of wine activity and from our farm's perspective you know we've we've got strawberries and zucchinis and tomatoes and eggplants and it's you know through February March it's probably the the absolute you know peak of um, of the veggie produce uh, and you're getting a, you're getting a lot of amazing, you know, fruits and things off the off the trees as well. So, you know, if, if um, in terms of food and wine, um, I think February is a great time to target Clare because the South Australians have had their holidays, they've returned back to school. The holidays mm-hmm. are generally in you know, Christmas through to Australia Day, which is January the 26th. Um, and and you, it just sort of falls away after then. That local tourism falls away. And I think it is an amazing opportunity for um, one day, eventually, uh, international tourism to, to return. I love that, though. Take your pick. If you want to cozy up by the fire and have a glass of red, enjoy it. And if you want to do it in the summertime, you have that option too with less crowds. It's the best yeah. of both worlds. That's it. Well, thank you very much, Warwick. Very looking forward to talking to you about the Watervale Hotel in our podcast on Thursday. No worries at all. Look forward to it. I'll tell you this. After interviewing Warwick, I was thirsty. I went out to a local restaurant in Melbourne and lo and behold, Clare Valley Riesling was on the menu. I can officially say he's right. The wine is truly spectacular. 
Warwick joins us again on Thursday to discuss the Watervale Hotel, a must visit if traveling to the Clare Valley. If there are any destinations you'd like to hear more about, message us on our social channels at Low Season Traveller. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family and social networks. More now than ever, travel is better without the crowds. Mm-hmm.